and ones with the bow and arrow. And the bow is laced with this sharp edge, so if you get close to them, they can still block you, they can still attack you, and I think they really did it right with the arrows. They have this very aggressive hum, so it's almost like a bee. You know, it really feels dangerous with these arrows, and you can block some of them, but otherwise you will probably get hit by them. One of the enemies can call in reinforcements through this transport kind of thing. Again, if this one enemy spots you, he'll try to call for reinforcements. Sometimes you can prevent him from getting to where he has to call reinforcements, and sometimes, in fact, I think overall, most of the time, you can speed kill him. But if you fail in speed killing, you then have to deal with all of the reinforcements, and that can get a little grating, honestly. There are a couple of enemies sort of recycled from Warrior Within, and that is a little bit awkward. More awkward is the fact that in this, even though the Prince still does the moves, and it'll still do the slow-mo death scene thing, and the camera, they no longer get sliced in half or decapitated, so they'll just fall over. I mean, I guess this was because of censorship, but it just feels kind of dumb. Because it draws so much attention to itself. I don't know, maybe they didn't have time to remove the slow-mo and the camera focusing on their death. I guess they just really wanted to make sure that no one would be offended by it. No one but all the people who are offended by really sloppy, half-assed censorship, that is. The speed kill feature is also put to great use with the boss enemies. We get several very memorable boss fights in this one. The final one is, in my opinion, the best boss fight in these six games. It is just so much fun, so adrenaline pumping, and so satisfying to win. Now, as I already mentioned, this is the shortest of these three. To summarize, Sands of Time took two days, Warrior Within took a bit more than two days, maybe two and a half. This one took maybe a day and a half. Like, the remainder of the day that I spent finishing off Warrior Within, and then one more day. And that was it. It certainly doesn't risk overstaying its welcome. It is a really great way to tie off this trilogy, though. As far as I understand, the 2008 game is indeed a reboot, so it doesn't follow this same story. And while I'm sometimes against rebooting, I mean, sometimes it just seems to be, you know, just for the sake of it, in this case, it really seems like they've done what they should do with this character. I think doing more in this same series, with this same iteration of Prince, would just be milking it, honestly. And that's also kind of the feeling I have that the Forgotten Sands might be. Which probably won't keep me from eventually playing it, because I love this gameplay. This has some inner monologuing from the Prince again, like in the Sands of Time. And it also has some narration from Kylina, and there's a bit much of it. It's way too poetic in its language, and it's also kind of repetitive. If you want a good drinking game, maybe take a shot every single time the prince says something along the lines of, This place was so beautiful when I was younger, and now it's all gone. There are much fewer weapons in this than there were in Warrior Within. Almost the same amount of overall types though. I hear that some criticize the chariot racing in this. I don't know. I kind of like it. It's very intense. And, you know, it works. Basically, you're riding a chariot at fast speeds. You can't slow down or speed up. All you can do is go from side to side. You know, make turns and, you know, avoid crashing right into something. You really have to admire those horses and their sheer determination and loyalty and unwavering faith in you, the driver, because they will jump right over and into something or run right into a wall. You can use the rewind time ability. Other than that, you can just go side to side 
and if an enemy jumps onto your chariot, attack them with the blade. If you don't, they'll kill you. Some of the enemies will drive chariots also and try to ram you into a wall and you have to ram them into a wall. It's kind of like that scene in Ben-Hur. What do you mean make a reference to a movie that's not 50 years old? Okay, fine. The Simpsons episode, Saturdays of Thunder. Remember Bart and Nelson riding in soapbox cars? You know, ramming into each other, trying to push the other off. It's just a lot of fun. Earlier I mentioned that the sands of time in this don't seem to affect everyone. Also, it seems to go really, really far because there keeps being guards that have been turned. I mean, in the first one it was the palace and the immediate sounding surrounding area, but how far do they go? In this one, your main weapon is now the dagger. That makes sense because you have to kill those infected with the sands of time with the dagger. And that also allows you to still have a secondary weapon, which you can again throw. Having the dagger as the main weapon also again gives you some new cool moves. You can use it as a lever by sticking it into an unfinished mechanism and you know just letting your weight pull it down and there are these plates that you can stab into and then you can jump up stab into another plate or you can launch yourself into a wall run you can jump away from having stabbed into the plate the puzzles are again really great although near the very end after a section that like the one in warrior within is really frustrating although this time i think they did it a little bit better near the very end it does feel like they were kinda running out of good ideas for good puzzles. I don't know, then again two years later they came out with TMNT and that has great use of this engine so there are again life bonuses and like in Warrior Within you have to pass some traps to get to it and in this one you walk into the light to receive the bounty. There are three difficulty settings and unlockables, and that's about it for replayability. I also think this does a really great job of not having so much new stuff that you get overwhelmed. You can really get into it, and, and you'll soon be using these new tools very comfortably, but still, it adds a ton. I mean, it really isn't just the same thing again. The camera now tells you when to switch to the panoramic view. I don't know, I suppose that could be construed as a little bit too much hand-holding. This is also the most glitchy of this trilogy, but with that said, in two entire playthroughs, I never had to start over, and it only threw me out of the game, I think, twice. And since it saves so frequently, I didn't lose any progress. I mean, on Warrior Within, there was such a bad glitch that I had to use a different profile just to complete the game. The camera tends to help you and seldom screws you over like it did in Warrior Within. Overall, again, great fun if you're into, you know, running around, jumping, solving good challenging fights, intense and addictive gameplay. And if you've played the first two, I would definitely recommend you get this one also. It ties it up so nicely. It really wraps it up. Just That was my spoiler-free review of the first six Prince of Persia games. I hope you